Hello and welcome to another episode of Taxonomy. My name is Uzair Yunus and today uh, I have a regular guest Farooq Hussain who's a business and economy journalist joining me once more. Um and I call on Farooq uh, either on a phone call and usually on Pakistanomy when you know things are moving along in the economy and there's a lot of noise that uh, you need to tell the signal from um Khurram's awesome at it so he always uh, gets a ping from me in terms of saying come on the podcast he's given us some more of his time today Khurram welcome to the podcast pleasure to be here Ozair Khurram let's start with this whole conversation over the last two weeks that we've had and that continues uh, even today uh, which is Pakistan's about to default it doesn't have the reserves the credit default swap up by 95% you know Khan Saab saying uh that this is imminent shaukat tari in the form of finance minister saying that but pakistan made the sukuk payments um of a billion dollars of the bond that were due the next bond is due in april 2024 so on paper at least it seems uh that you know the default conversation should go away but it hasn't um how do you see the payback of the sukuk the default conversation and the broader external sector challenges that the economy is facing right now Sir, I think the repayment of the sukuk in the absence of uh, the revival of the fund program, and we're now talking of revival, although it was really one review that was supposed to have been completed in November. Um, but we'll get to it in a moment. Why we are now calling it a revival of the program? Uh, it's seriously in the doldrums. But uh, I think the repayment of the sukuk in the absence of uh, a clear path forward on the fund program has, in fact, now aggravated Pakistan's external uh, sector situation. Uh, the sukuk uh, was not supposed to represent a drain on the reserves because the state bank was telling us uh, in the last monetary policy uh, meeting that they have arranged a billion dollar inflow with which to affect this repayment of which uh, i believe a 500 million dollars worth of which has already been announced from uh, the, the a- remainder, uh, aiib from the is. aiib exactly but there's an additional 500 million that has not yet been announced i don't know if that's imminent if that will be coming anytime soon uh, or what so on the, so for one part there is it does represent a bit of a drain on the reserves but more importantly um it does burden the external sector at a time when the external sector is searching for a way forward and uh, the way forward so far was not very clear but after dar's interview uh, on the airwaves yesterday or last night uh, it's become even more murky because he actually went so far as to say if the imf wants to play hardball with us then uh, uh, so be it and we're not going to um, plead with them was uh, the kind of tone that he took and uh, and and said that well in that case we'll move ahead without the imf now that is uh, is worrying uh, because that revives the fears of a default the only thing averting a default so far um was yes the availability of some reserves and some uh, inflows with which to meet immediate debt service obligations such as the sukuk that's going to mature on december 5 on monday uh but uh, at the same time the default conversation w- was being driven by the the state of the imf program so in july it seemed like we are getting very close to a default in fact the early signs had begun to appear uh at that point and then all that receded in the end of august when the the review was completed the program was revived the staff level agreement was released to the public and um, uh, but now all of those fears are back again uh, the fund program is back on the rocks and um, uh, the reserves are uh, continuing to be drained despite the fact that the current account deficit is shrinking imports are shriveling up um, and um, i and uh, i think without a fund program now uh, we can't talk of a default on external debt service obligations such as the euro bond but there are other obligations on which a default could now become a possibility such as on import related lcs and um, also there's about a 3 billion dollar maturity of uh, commercial uh, debt debt taken from commercial banks that cannot be rolled over 
Um, and uh, that maturity, I'm seeing different figures, but um, you know, we've seen the finance minister yesterday mention that $3 billion is due for maturity in December. Uh, I just need to be sure whether he actually meant that or uh, um, because it sounds like a very he heavy schedule of repayments. Uh, but nevertheless, there are uh, payment obligations continue to weigh on the country. And uh, without a, a fund program, it becomes very, very difficult to see how uh, these obligations are going to be met in the near future. And from your perspective, is this fear actually what um, is driving sort of the broader uncertainty in, let's say, the exchange market or the conversation in the business media, for example, about LCs and even oil LCs being opened. And of course, the state bank rebutted that story earlier this week, saying that no such thing has happened. But there is this nervousness, right? Everybody, at least that I talk to, and you uh, will probably say the same, is nervous. There is a 25 rupee gap in terms of the interbank rate of the dollar versus what you can get if you're lucky enough to get it in the open market, et cetera. Is in, from your perspective, is all of this linked to this IMF drain on IMF program revitalization, drain on Forex reserves, and the finance minister basically confusing market participants by his interviews and his commentary itself? Was that in my conversations with people over here, I'm picking up extreme nervousness. There is uh, very, very high levels of uh, anxiety. And this is uh, conversations from industry services or financial services uh, people. Uh, bankers are talking about uh, the, the increasing intensification of the state bank's um, efforts to try and restrict dollar outflows. Um, exporters are, uh, I mean, they themselves are not saying this, but their bankers are telling us uh, in generic terms without taking names, but they're saying exporters are now extremely shy of bringing their export proceeds back to the country, uh, given the uncertain outlook on the exchange rate. Um, Exchange companies are talking about uh, a, a large burden that the open market has to carry to pay for um, certain fuel imports coming from Afghanistan, uh, specifically coal. And uh, they use this to explain why there's such a huge gap between the interbank rate and the curb or the open market rate. The open market does not have the kind of depth to uh, handle the bulky uh, payments that uh, are there in the fuel supply chain. So, and uh, and importers though are telling us that uh, it's become next to impossible uh, to uh, open an LC now. Uh, you know, it's become a standard procedure and uh, bankers call this flow tracking uh, where bankers now have to submit a list every day of all um, LCs that they wish to open, that their clients are applying to open. And that list is sent to the state bank. And the next morning, it comes back from the state bank, tick marked that these ones are allowed, these ones are not. So and the numbers... can, I, can I interrupt here? What yeah. you're describing essentially to me sounds like the central bank is intervening in the exchange market and is basically rationing the supply of foreign currency in the market without saying so much. Very much, very much. Um, in terms of import restrictions, the the interventions are, are open. They are known. There are directives coming out from the state bank uh, that are that are there on their website. Um, but in terms of uh, uh, less uh, or or those interventions that are not talked about, those that are whispered, um, they include things like uh, telling the banks to apply or at least first obtain verbal permission uh, from the central bank before making or affecting any kind of an interbank transaction. So right now, even the interbank market is uh, uh, not exactly a vibrant place, from what I'm hearing, at least, from those who participate in this market. They say that uh, um, they've basically been told that uh, don't lift liquidity from the from the forwards markets uh, or, uh, or even borrowing from each other. Um, uh, settle your LCs based on your own cash flows. Uh, so if you have you if you're a bank that has large number of exporters and people sending remittances, fine, you've got some dollars inflows coming in that you can use to uh, uh, 
um, transact on uh, uh, for other clients on their LCs. But if you don't have large amounts of these inflows, then you're a bank that's turning customers away and saying, sorry, we can't open an LC for you. Um, so, so right now, I think the, the situation in the uh, foreign exchange markets is an extreme one. Um, I've rarely seen it this tight, although this entire calendar year is unique um, in the sense that we've seen an intensification throughout the year, um, but it's not going away anytime soon. So there, there, there's, there's absolutely a, a great deal of uh, nervousness, anxiety, and uh, and fear about what's happening in, uh, in in the foreign exchange markets. I was actually talking to someone about this. Hiram, they, I'm trying to get them on the podcast as well because they're in the manufacturing sector. Nothing huge, but you know, the last time I met them a few months ago and spoke about this, uh, before this uncertainty set in, um, they were quite bullish about making things in Pakistan, the demand for, you know, inputs in, that they were seeing. Um, and they were in the in the chip making, uh, you know, not super high end chips, but like the ones that go in refrigerators and things like that. Um, he's been really upset about this entire process as well, in the sense that, you know, what he imports is actually a critical input into domestic products. And the goal should be to make more things of that kind in Pakistan. But now they're suffering because of this rationing that's going on. So I think it's having these unintended consequences um, that perhaps the state bank or the finance ministry is not realizing um, that, that their you know, ham-fisted approach is, is sort of undermining a lot of other businesses that perhaps are not the importers the way we think about importers leading to a current account deficit into the economy. Um, another thing that stood out to me in the DAR interview from last night, um, and I'll do a shameless plug of my other podcast, Nazuk Moore, where we're talking about the security situation in Afghanistan. But he did say that coal demand and Afghan dollar demand is causing a lot of issues. We're going to do administrative actions. And I, as the finance minister, have spoken to the relevant people, basically meant the establishment. And then, of course, we had the story this week as well about defense-related imports requiring a similar approval the way you described on the LC side. Um, what One, what do you make of the finance minister's argument that Afghanistan and the dollar drain from coal or whatever into Afghanistan is having a big impact on the market? Are you hearing something similar? And two, is this something that can be solved by administrative actions the way he's describing publicly? I started hearing about these imports back in July. And there was actually an announcement by the government uh, with Mr. Ismail saying that they are going to do this. It was a matter of policy to open up coal imports from Afghanistan uh, because it was a lot cheaper to buy coal from Afghanistan rather than buy from South Africa or from um, any other of the major suppliers you know, from where Pakistani power producers get it, get their coal from. And uh, from that point onwards, uh, it was basically the heads of exchange companies who started, uh, because that's when the, the, the spread between the interbank and the open market rate began to uh, open up. And uh, that this is what the exchange companies were telling us back then that uh, uh, huge dollar requirements are now coming to the to them in the open market uh, in order to uh, settle and, and make the payments for for these coal imports. And uh, the the open market is not geared towards uh, making such large payments, you know. Uh, people go into the open market to buy 10, 10 15, 20,000 dollars tops, maybe 25. I mean, it's not geared towards uh, servicing millions of dollars a day. Yeah, you're uh, not going in, to the open market the market. to service uh, energy imports. Exactly. It's, it's not built for that. It's uh, it, it, it hasn't been designed for that. But now that burden has been placed upon it. And uh, they were saying, what are we supposed to do? Um the, the strange thing is that uh, at least in some of the power plants that I've looked at, you know, they, they actually have to disclose as part of their fuel cost adjustment uh, determination uh, the, the amount of fuel that they've bought and where they've bought it from. And I'm not yet seeing Afghanistan show up as a supplier in those submissions that they give to the regulator. They're there on the website. And um, the, the, the last one that you can see would be from August. And I believe the September ones would be up too. Uh, by now, maybe even I think October ones might also be up. We should take another look. But we're not yet seeing that show up as a supplier, number one. 
Number two, when the Afghanistan coal imports business was opened in July, the idea was that the settlement will be in rupees. This was part of another um, arrangement that Pakistan was bringing about with the, the new Taliban government that trade, bilateral trade between these two partners will be settled in rupees, Pakistani rupees. But in reality, what's happening is at least what the exchange companies are telling us. In reality, what happens is when the coal supplier comes, uh, they insist on dollar payment. They say, yeah, whatever the government to government arrangement may be or whatever the official arrangement may be, we want dollars. We don't want uh, Pakistan. Which, which I think makes sense, right? If the if the businessman in Anarkali or Kapra market is dollarizing, I mean, it kind of yeah, makes sure. sense for the Kabul trader to also dollarize, not keep not? rupee yeah. on their okay. hand. For obvious reasons, they would want, uh, and, and number two, they want cash dollars. They don't really, uh, n- nothing else satisfies them. So the the open market is the only place where you can get cash dollars. And uh, so actually, it, it's something worth looking into more carefully to see what's going on. I can't claim I have a very clear picture, whatever I have, I've shared with you. Um, but uh, if Darsab wants to talk of shutting this down altogether, that's fine. Okay, that constricts one of the uh, dollar outflow streams that we have going right now. But on the other hand, um, wh- where else are you going to source that coal from? If you're not buying it from Afghanistan, what do you do? You buy it from South Africa instead. Uh, granted, th- those transactions will be through the interbank market, but those that coal is even more expensive. Um, and it will represent even more of a drain on your forex reserves. So the, I'm not sure to what extent they can shut it down. Yeah, and on the Afghanistan thing, I mean, that information is and context is really helpful because two things I've noticed. Um, I was looking at sort of the official export-import data from Afghanistan by the state bank. And if you take a look at it, roughly speaking, there was a $3 billion or so surplus, trade surplus Pakistan had. So $3 billion of uh, were coming in pre-August 15th, pre the fall of Kabul. Um, that official data seems to have shrunk to about half a billion or so. So basically, there's been a net loss of two and a half, two billion dollars in terms of the inflow of foreign currency Pakistan was getting. So that obviously has an impact both on the interbank side and on the open market side, because it was a revenue or a dollar surplus market for Pakistan. Um, the second interesting thing, Khuram, that perhaps you and I should talk offline and, and see whether we can dig a bit deeper into is that the value of the Afghan currency has remained uh, static. In, in this entire process, uh, you know, and of course, that's that's a bit weird because they've been closed out to the foreign markets. The banking system is not lending to Afghanistan because of sanctions, et cetera. So how is it that the Afghan currency, both officially and unofficially, is trending stable um, in a situation where the Pakistani rupee is not? And as we know, Afghanistan has a dollar shortage. Uh, where are these dollars coming from? Um, is a question mark that at least I have in my mind. Um, maybe you will after this conversation as well in terms of looking into how is it that Afghanistan is uh, beginning or continuing to sustain its well, sort of flows of dollars. I have a question regarding that. Uh, a few other people have been asking me this as well. And my question is, how liquid is the Afghan uh, currency, first of all? Um from what I understand, again, uh, money changers here tell us that uh, nobody, there are no buyers for the Afghan currency. Now, if there are no buyers, it doesn't matter what price you're quoting for it. So I just wonder how real of a price that is, because right now on paper, the price of the Pakistani rupee in the open market is about 231 rupees. Uh, but you're not going to find it at 231 rupees. Uh, likewise, if the on paper the value of the Afghan um, uh, currency is, you know, let's say X versus the Pakistani rupee, uh, then the question is, do buyers actually exist at that price? Um, I'd I'd like to know that first. Correct. That, uh, I, I, that that's a question I have as well. And then the the second follow on question in my mind after that is. Well, if this is true that the price doesn't really reflect anything because it doesn't have a demand or there's no demand for this currency in the market in any case, well, how is it that Afghanistan is paying for all the stuff that it still needs, right? Yes, the economy there is in doldrums, but still you have basic necessities that have to be purchased and sold and traded in the market, particularly through Pakistan. Where is that money coming from? And can we 
ascertain what that demand is, right? It's kind of similar to what, you know, we talk about in the wheat market now is essentially is that Pakistan's wheat demand uh, should take into account Afghan wheat demand as well, because a lot of it gets smuggled or a similar conversation happening on the fertilizer side. Is it time we have a similar conversation in terms of the dollar needs in Pakistan, plus the Afghan one that needs to be kept in mind at the bank and the finance ministry? Yeah. Uh, oh, so, no, I, I, so something I, I to look into. So, definitely. Yeah, so definitely. We'll, yeah. we'll look into that. The other thing, uh, Huram, on, on, on in terms of let's get to the IMF side of this, right? And you, you talked about the need to revitalize it. Um, first up, like, where did it go south? Because we saw um, MIFTA sort of had reached an agreement um, when, you know, this conversation was going on in Washington. People were pretty satisfied that things will trend in the right direction. But one thing I heard, for example, even from folks close to the IMF was that, you know, they were like, every time we reach some level of working relationship with somebody on the Pakistan side and have sort of an agreement, you guys see your finance minister and we have to kind of start from scratch because the new finance minister brings in a new approach. Uh, Dar famously was like, Main aankho, main dal ke inse negotiate karunga. I've been talking to them for 25 years. Where did this go wrong? And what are you hearing in terms of how to revitalize it? Because we're in what, December 3rd, everyone's about to go in Washington on holidays. You know, you're looking at mid-Jan yeah. if you lose another week here. Yeah. And I think it's pretty clear by now that we are going at least into mid-Jan after the interview last night. If that is the mood that Mr. Dar is in, um, I don't, it, it's going to be very difficult to see unless phone calls go from, you know, uh, Rahul Pindi to Washington. General Munir will call Wendy Sherman this yeah, time around. General Munir calling Wendy Sherman again. Or, so if, if that sort of a thing happened, that's, that's separate. But in any case, to your question, what where, where did things go wrong? Um, was that they went wrong in April 2021. Uh, they went wrong when Hafiz Sheikh was trying to revive the IMF program after it was suspended, temporarily suspended, uh, in March 2020 after the COVID lockdowns began. So from March 2020 till about November 2020, uh, Pakistan was not really on an IMF program. Uh, or if it was, that program was under temporary suspension. Uh, in November or so, 2020, uh, Hafiz Sheikh began talks with the IMF to restart the, the program. Those talks And, and really quickly, of... if I may interject here, during that period of suspension or pause, um, there were additional funds provided by both the IMF yes. and the ADB and the World Bank for COVID yes. fighting. So there was an injection of dollars. It wasn't a That's right. typical suspension that we think of that money is not flowing in. In fact, they gave more money because it was a catastrophe. Exactly. In fact, uh, uh, the amount of money that flowed into Pakistan as a result of uh, uh, these in, these these injections that you're talking about was comparable to the kind of money that flowed into Pakistan after 9-11. Um, it was, in fact, a, a COVID, far from being uh, an economic uh, burden on this country, was, in fact, the opposite. It created, uh, it gave the government the opportunity to create a, a, a boom using externally external liquidity to finance it. Um, and, and that's what they were doing. So the growth rate began to pick up somewhere around August 2020. We began to see, you know, what the state bank called high frequency indicators uh, begin to show some activity in after a year and a half of being totally moribund. Um, and uh, by December 2020, the, 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 there was a bit of a boom shaping up within the economy. But at the same time, on the other side, Hafiz, on a separate track, Hafiz Sheikh had begun talks to revive the IMF program. Uh, those talks dragged on. They were supposed to have been completed by November. That November went into February. February went into March. And it wasn't until end March that uh, the, the cabinet approval was obtained on the relevant legislation that needed to be passed and, uh, and the various targets that had been agreed to with the fund. And no sooner had that program been signed that uh, and the staff level agreement sent to the executive board and the board approved it and the board and the funds were released. The IMF released about, what was it, about a billion dollars um, in in April 2021. Within days, Hafiz Sheikh was was out. And uh, um, he very the, the conveniently sort of lost his Senate election. Conveniently lost his Senate elections and uh, was the government was not interested in uh, finding an alternative way to keep uh, to, to stick with him. 
and uh, and he was sort of seen off very unceremoniously. It was pretty evident from the manner in which he was sent that the government was unhappy with him. And uh, then we had a couple of weeks when there were when Hamad Azhar was sort of uh, warming the seat of the finance minister until Shaukat Tareen was was appointed. And the first thing, if you remember, Shaukat Tareen said was that we are going to renegotiate this agreement. We don't like it. And uh, that's when this whole thing began. Uh, in June, Shaukat Tareen announced an expansionary budget, whereas according to the fund program, that ought to have been the beginning of unwinding the entire stimulus that uh, the government had administered in the summer of 2020. Um, but they went in the opposite direction. They juiced the stimulus further. And uh, so, uh, and then... They spent all that time from about June 2020 till December 2020, 20, sorry, June 2021 till December 2021, trying to renegotiate the program, but it didn't work. They didn't I remember really at that negotiate. time uh, in, in the fall meetings, Tareen Saab was here and he basically, his speech was basically the way I wrote down in my notes uh, that he gave at the Pakistan embassy at a public event was basically we're going to spend, spend and then spend some more. Yeah, he was in no mood to uh, to not spend. He was indulging uh, Imran Khan uh, to his heart's content, uh, juicing the economy. The deficits were growing. The reserves had begun to fall from August 2021 onwards, right? Well, end of August, beginning of September, thereabouts. If you look at the reserves, they start falling. So they, the reserves had peaked. Inflation had begun to appear. Um, the... the um, um, the, the the fiscal deficit was beginning to climb in every way. The economy was showing signs of overheating at that point. But they continued. And uh, by about Jan 2022, if you remember, they suddenly railroaded two pieces of legislation that they had earlier said we don't agree with. The State Bank Act in particular. When was pushed, Sheikh was out, pushed through in four minutes. Pushed through in four minutes. But when he was ousted, if you go back to April 2021, you'll hear these the same people uh, who was speaking in favor of it, the independent central bank suddenly in January, he was saying that, well, what's with this legislation? We don't agree with it. We're not going to allow this to pass. That was one of the key things they were supposed to renegotiate uh, with the fund. I remember that, they... that period in time for him very uh, clearly in the sense that it was really weird uh, being on the side of the PTI for state bank independence, um, arguing against some elements of the PTI itself and the PMLN and others who are saying, critiquing, rightfully so, the process that was being followed. And then finding out that this had been put in cold storage and then all of a sudden comes back without any debate in parliament. And parliament in four minutes passes that. And and to yeah. me, at least on that, right, like, I mean, the state bank and the and parliament is also to blame in that sense that, A, you railroaded this through, but B, since it was passed, why has the state bank not been grilled in its failure to secure the mandate that it has, which is fighting inflation, right? Yeah. We, we've talked about yeah, this yeah. a lot. Like, you can't just say, I want independence without accountability. And they clearly are not willing to be held accountable for the fact that you now have a mandate to fight inflation. What have you done since that mandate was given to you? Well, I think it's all there. It's there in front of us, what they've done. Um, we can talk about, uh, you know, the the state bank and how well it's discharging its function. To Let, let's come back to this where where apart. where it fell apart. Um, see, February, April, twenty twenty two, we knew what was going on, but then Mifta had brought things sort of back online in, in yeah. a way, right? So, where did since Mifta negotiating this to today, wh what are some key events that you think things fell apart? Because well, I'm still trying to figure out what exactly went wrong here. Well, I mean, it, it's the same story that happened with Hafiz Sheikh. Okay, the government of his time was unhappy at the fact that uh, the, the program he negotiated carried strict conditions. They ousted him. They brought in another guy. The other guy said, well, I'll talk tough to them and renegotiate this and get you a better deal. And they went with that. Uh, when that guy was ousted, Mifta comes in. Mifta gets the whole thing back on track again. And... Uh, the government and the new government, the PDM, does the exact same thing all over again. They oust the guy who who agreed, to, who made this uh, agreement, and they fall for this other guy who's telling them, well, I can get you a better deal. This guy didn't negotiate hard enough. Uh, and they brought in Dar. Now, Dar is somebody who's well known to uh, to people in the international financial uh, institutions. He's been doing this for 25 years in his own words. Yeah, as he puts it, he's been doing this for 25 years. 
Um, although, you know, if you look at his track record, uh, Dar has not been able to deliver in difficult circumstances. So, think, if, so at... if I were to use an analogy for Dar, given that there's an England versus Pakistan test series going on, which in the Rahul Pindi pitch, like I'm not, I'm refusing to watch it because it's an atrocious pitch they built, but that's another topic. But in terms of the Pakistan cricket analogy, Dar is like, you know, the chronic opening batsman like Imran Nazir, who's br- brought in and out of the team. Um, and everybody says, Ko chance pura nahi mila. Dar's career oh. has survived because people claim that he has no chance if he gets a series puri kar leta, to shayad, we wouldn't have been in this situation in the first place. Well, now he's chance mil rahe na. now he's getting the chance and we're seeing uh, uh, you know, w- what he intends to do with it. Um, but but, uh, but to, to answer your question, what went wrong, it was this. It was the fact that the guy who renegotiated the program was ousted. A new guy was brought in uh, who had different ideas. And he felt he can somehow bargain a better deal. Now, the new guy is finding out that that's not possible. Uh, the world has changed. Uh, Pakistan's place in the world has changed. Uh, Pakistan's bargaining position versus its creditors is uh, has deteriorated significantly over the past half decade or so. Um, in fact, over the past, I mean, it's happened over the years in any case, but over the past five years, there's been a marked accelerated uh, um, uh, deterioration in Pakistan's bargaining position vis-a-vis its creditors. So, now, and now he's finding all this out. He's like, well, the IMF is acting abnormally. Well, what's abnormal? That, I was going to uh, say, they, like, do you think the IMF is behaving abnormally? To me, it doesn't seem like that. I think they're being no, totally it's not. rational. In fact, in fact, all the waivers that he was getting while he was the finance minister from 2013 to 2018, that was abnormal. You know, at that time, they were sort of leveraging a geopolitical uh, card um, of sorts in order to get for themselves a very favorable treatment uh, that many other countries would not get. Uh, what you're getting now from the, or what, I mean, what I would say to to Mr. Dar is that what you're getting now is the normal treatment. This is what any normal country actually has to go through. Um, you, you, you've got to listen to your, to your creditors if you are interested in maintaining your credit worthiness. If you're not interested in, in that, if you feel that I'm here to serve the people and uh, the creditors can wait, fine. Um, but then let that be your... Your, your plank, you know, but on or, the one hand, if you... Or, or yeah, I would ahead. say that, that there's, you know, <clears throat> there's this one, you get treated normally, or you sort of are a bit more strategic, like in Argentina or in Egypt, where you actually offer something geopolitically, right? Egypt gave up its islands. Um, the Argentinians sort of played very well uh, last year, or earlier this year, in terms of the IMF negotiations, the Americans and the Chinese in terms of Latin America and China's influence there. Um, so you got to be either good with that game. And if you blow that part up, then yes, you will get treated like any other country. And this is not abnormal. This is just how the world works. And and that's where we are. Yeah, I think Argentina is a bit of a, a, a different case from everybody else, just by virtue of the size of their debt burden. Um, they are literally too big to fail. And if, I think they can actually play the card and say, okay, well, you want us to default? And they've done it more than once. And I think Argentina is one of the few countries that has actually defaulted while on an IMF program. There aren't many examples of that, but uh, this is one of the exceptions. So, uh, um, and, but Pakistan right now, you know, they've tried to leverage the too big to fail card for a number of years. Um, today, it's not working. Um, and uh, there is no way out of this particular morass that we're in, other than an economic way out, right? Um, maybe, maybe now Dar is saying that he's got a $3 billion commit, uh, he's got a $3 billion rabbit in his hat and that he's going to pull out in two weeks. He said well, he's that gone from the, 13 billion to 3 billion, so I'm not super confident yeah, about yeah, his well, pronunciation. Suddenly, he's now including the rollovers in the 13 billion. That wasn't the case when he initially announced those in, um, in uh, the earlier this month. Um, this was, we were told, going to be fresh, uh, these were going to be fresh inflows. Correct. Last night when he was asked, he said, well, what about the $3 billion rollover? Well, that's not a fresh inflow, you know, so he's already sort of brought it down a notch. Now he's saying, okay, $3 billion in the next two weeks, about to land. That's what he's telling us. Great. We'll see. Friendly country. Um, the, you know, some kind of a geopolitical gambit being played or what. If that inflow materializes by middle of December, 
then yes, I think uh, Dar would have uh, successfully bought his government a few more months for maybe five months, maybe less, I don't know, but a few more months for sure. And uh, the sense of an urgent, immediate, imminent uh, potential default on the LC or potential default on a commercial debt service obligation will begin to recede if that inflow materializes. I'm a bit skeptical. I'm holding out. I'm not going to pronounce one way or the other. I'm a bit skeptical because usually bilateral creditors are reluctant to disperse in the absence of an IMF program. One exception to that was last year in November 2021, when the Saudis did place a $3 billion safe deposit with Pakistan before the fund program had been uh, finalized. But uh, at that point in time, at least there was positive direction on the fund program. Even though it hadn't yet materialized, the Saudis could have turned to the fund and said, how much progress are the Pakistanis making? And the fund would have replied saying, you know, we've ticked eight of the 10 boxes that we were supposed to tick. The other two will be sorted out. It's a matter of time. That this time the around, option. this time around, the IMF was calling the Saudis this... to say, hey, are you depositing the money that you've committed to? Because they're telling us that you are and we are not sure, right? This, this was covered in the public media in, in earlier yes. this year as well. So it's yes. a fundamental shift in approach. It is. It, it's a shift in approach. And uh, the the I think I, 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 it seems it makes sense to me that any bilateral partner would be very hesitant to sink $3 billion into a country that is facing imminent default and trying to talk tough to the IMF at the same time. Um, but we'll see. Now, Dar has said that he's got $2 billion. He, he did also say he'll bring the dollar down to 200 rupees by the by the 1st of November. Um, that didn't happen. Now he's saying he's got a $3 billion rabbit in his hat that he's going to pull out in two weeks. We'll see. But if it doesn't happen, uh, Ozer, then, you know, by January or so, um, I do share the fears that I hear in the in the financial markets that uh, we're going to be in a very difficult situation. That's going to be a tough holiday season um, for Pakistan. We'll see where things Indeed. go. Last question for you, Khuram. Obviously, um, this interview from last night, and we've seen uh, murmurings, open sort of exchanges on this, etc. In the Dar versus Mifta uh, argument, obviously, Dr. Mifta Ismail has been very vocal in his op-eds and his public engagements about what's wrong with the economy in so many ways, taking on Darunomics without saying so. Um, I had a Twitter exchange with him. I said, Mr. Mif Dr. Mif Ismail has finally gone rogue within his party by his public, uh, his last article for Don. He said, I'm not going rogue. I'm saying what I was for a long time. And yesterday, Dar was asked about Mifta, any sort of, you know, I don't want to talk about him, but he didn't arrange the financing either. And, you know, this is a different topic and I don't want to comment. How do you see this internal fight in the PMLN uh, between the Darwing of the party and the Dr. Ismail wing of the party? Where do you stand in this? I see it taking a very, very ugly turn. And um, I think as the situation deteriorates, it gives Mifta the opportunity to say, I told you so. And he's not going to uh, uh, pass by, pass over that opportunity. And um, and that prompts, and because Dar is a person who takes his ego very, very seriously, uh, that, uh, you know, pro that's his prompt to sort of hit back. Um, it's taken an ugly turn because uh, already Mifta has been targeted with a very nasty uh, set of allegations that pretty clearly seem to be coming from within the party. Um, this is it, it, it does not sound like these allegations are coming from anywhere, from anyone outside. Um, we can go into that, but just like, you know, you, you, you've seen it as well. You've seen the vlog. Um, the allegations are false. Okay, that is easy enough to actually uh, uh, establish. But that's neither here nor there, right? This is the era of accusing somebody and just sort of tarnishing them on the basis of accusations only. Um, so if it takes a really nasty turn and if the uh, situation continues to deteriorate, then, uh, you know, the party is going to have to, the party leadership is going to have to do something to uh, uh, hold itself together uh, through all this. I think they are not fully appreciating uh, or if they are they're not let they it, it's not apparent from their public uh, you know pronouncements and their moves 
that they fully appreciate the depth of the economic economic situation and uh, that they don't fully appreciate how the political fallout that this is going to create for them if the economy continues to deteriorate if mr dar keeps promising us rabbits without being able to pull them out um then not only within the party but between the party and the establishment differences could begin to open up as well and it is possible that more and more people in powerful positions in pakistan's power structure may start to say that uh, well it seems like you guys aren't really able to handle this what do you say we move into fresh elections and bring in somebody who is uh, able to they need to be wary of that they need to be aware that uh, economic failure carries political costs for them it will not stay confined to only the the economic side yeah i think that last point is so important because um it's something i've been telling folks here in dc as well that while the new leadership of the military may say they're apolitical or would like to be apolitical the longer this economic decline continues or the faster it gets um the more uh, elements uh, will draw them in uh, to be political because economics as much as folks on twitter and friends of ours like to say let's disconnect economics from politics um economics is a fundamental political issue um especially when it the conversation is about taxation reforms resources etc um so it will be uh, not a political at that point in time if things continue to go south but again huram thank you so much for taking out the time for sharing your insights with us um as you said it's going to be a tricky 6 weeks or so we'll see where things go the holiday season is approaching so there will be a bit of a pause in terms of you know at least on the IMF DC side of the conversation and we'll see how pakistan's economy shapes up and whether the 3 billion materialize or not but i will bother you as always once more when we have some more clarity on that but appreciate all your insights and analysis thank you so much always a pleasure take care of yourself